I'm Seth Stern, co-author of uh, Justice Brennan, Liberal Champion. And Steve Wormiel, um, the other co-author of Justice Brennan, Liberal Champion. I don't think anybody has had the access to the same degree to a sitting justice. I mean, I did 60 hours of interviews with him while he was still sitting on the court in his last four years on the court. Uh, he opened up all of his files, correspondence files, which are still closed to other people, uh, his case files, many of which are now open to researchers, and what he called the term histories, which are these narrative accounts that he had the law clerks write of, of the major cases of the term and how those cases evolved. Um, and, and some of those are now open to other researchers as well. Um, but I don't think anybody else has had the kind of um, access while a justice was still sitting on the court and, and to such a complete set of, of papers and, and documents as well as the interviews. Um, it started with um, Judge Abner Mikva, uh, when he was the chief judge of the D.C. Circuit, was, was uh, somebody I had gotten to know fairly well and Justice Brennan had become friendly with. And um, the Judge Mikva knew that Brennan was looking for a biographer and asked me if I wanted to meet with Brennan. They didn't tell me that. They let me think it was my idea and that I was going to sell Brennan on the need for a biography and then that I should be the biographer as well. And, and so I thought this was going to be some Herculean uh, you know, sales effort. Uh, I, mean, I now know that's not the case because I don't think I'm that good a salesman. Uh, so Brennan was looking for somebody, and, and I had the good fortune to, to have that introduction from Mikva, and then I think I earned his trust. Well, I joined Steve as a co-author in uh, 2006. Uh, I had uh, a similar background in the sense that I'm both a lawyer and a journalist, and I think that that was Justice Brennan's vision of who he wanted for his biographer. He wanted a book that would be accessible to the public, uh, not just for lawyers and law students, something that an average person, if they were interested in, the, in his tenure, and particular, particularly the legacy of the Warren Court, could pick this book up and read it. And so that's how we approached the writing of it. We tried to make it accessible, and, uh, and hopefully we've achieved that. Well, for me, it, it's been a challenge all along. I put the book down for about 10 years, which it sort of explains why it's taken so long. And then I um, was very fortunate to find Seth when, when I was ready to, to pick the book back up. Um, I probably have always been overwhelmed by the amount of material, um, and, and Seth did a brilliant job synthesizing hundreds of thousands, I don't know, tens, at least tens of thousands of pages of material. Maybe it's even more than tens of thousands. Um, and, and it was not something that was easy for me to do. It wasn't easy for him, but he did a magnificent job of it. Um, I think it's always been hard to, to figure out whether you were really capturing Brennan. I'm, you know, writing somebody's biography, even when you knew the person and had time to ask the person lots of questions is still a challenge to feel like you're really capturing the person. I, I think we've done it. I give Seth huge credit for, for his role in that. I think judicial biography in particular is a real challenge because you're trying to balance so many different uh, things at once. You want his, you're trying to balance his work on the court with his personal life. How much do you get into every individual decision? How much do you pull back and give context for different areas of law? We did make a few decisions that I think helped guide us. Uh, we, we sort of t uh, put a, a minimum on his pre-court tenure, put the focus on his court tenure, and we did really try to write this book down the middle, even though it's an authorized biography. We didn't set out to write something that's hero worship or condemn him 
I think we give him the credit where he's due, whether you love him or loathe him, his influence is tremendous. But also call him uh, to task, take him to task on questions and issues where we thought that was necessary. And so I hope it's a book that does read down the middle. Yes. Uh, when, when he retired, he was very interested in how it was coming along. He, he read a couple of chapters, uh, complimented me on those chapters. Uh, but yeah, he was clearly frustrated uh, that it wasn't finished while he was still alive. No, he was too gracious. Um, you know, he never, uh, I mean, his, his, his warmth and charm were, were attributes to a fault, uh, in a sense. I mean, uh, occasionally he would ask how it was coming, and I would say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm finishing a chapter, and I hope to send it to you. I've had a lot of other things going on, and he would say, well, don't you worry about it, Steve. You just take your time. I'm sure you're doing fine, and and I understand that you're busy. And you know, it was that. It was always that kind of response. I would hear from other people that he was upset and frustrated, but he would never want to make me feel badly. Now, this is entirely self-serving, but I mean, there are aspects. There are ways that the book is better for having taken longer. There are papers of some of his colleagues, such as Lewis Powell and Harry Blackman, uh, that weren't available earlier, and they're a tremendously rich resource. People are more candid with the passage of time, members of his family and clerks that we went back and spoke with. They're just more candid than they would have been during when he was alive, and so that added an additional richness, particularly regarding his personal life. Uh, and there's just technologically, there are ways that researching is easier now with the internet and digital archives of newspapers, we could search every last reference that was ever made to him. And so hopefully I do, I do honestly believe, putting aside what my involvement, that the book is better now than it could have been then for, the, for those reasons. Yeah, I don't, uh, I, I think it actually started, uh, if I understood him correctly, I think it sort of started as an accident and then turned into a philosophical thing. I think he um, he missed the 52 presidential election for, for some reason in the 56 presidential election. I think the 52 presidential election he, he was moved. moving. Yeah. He had moved locations and hadn't registered yet in the new location, and then in 56 he'd moved to Washington and didn't do anything about it, and then I think he sort of decided that he liked it, that it, that it, it felt right to not have people wondering who he was voting for and how he was voting, and that, that he just, just kind of had the right feel to it. No, I just think it... I think in his own mind, inevitably, reporters would have been asking him, people would have been speculating, and so he was just happy that if anybody did ask him, you know, he didn't have an answer. What's funny is he was so revealing about almost everything in his interviews with Steve, but the one question that Steve could not pry out of him is, had he voted, would he have voted for President Eisenhower? That was like the, the deep, dark secret he could not get out of him. So. I think that contrast uh, the, between the, the conservative private man and the liberal justice, it's a, it's a fascinating contrast and it's not always easy to reconcile the two, but it makes for a richer book and a richer person when you have those sort of multiple dimensions to a person. I also think, I, I totally agree with that that is maybe one of the biggest surprises. Um, the other is maybe a more subtle point. Um, given the intellectual giants that Brennan had been surrounded by, or at least what the, what the legal establishment viewed as intellectual giants, 
and and everything I sort of knew about those people and and my expectation that Brennan was just a tactician. Um, I was surprised at how intelligent and thoughtful and deep and reflective and uh, and, and and what a, what a really smart man he was. Not that I expected him to be ignorant, but that I didn't necessarily expect to have sort of philosophical discussions with him about rights or about the role of the court and, and, and that sort of thing. And so um, he was a much more thoughtful, much more intellectual individual than I expected to find when I started. I think he's the, he really represents um, what I think is a very important image, not the only one, but a very important image of the role of the court in American society. He really represents the, the counter-majoritarianism of the court. He really is sort of the embodiment of the view that there will often be times when the court is the only institution that can protect a right or, or protect an interest because everybody else is responsive to voting majorities and the court isn't and, and can therefore have the ability to play that role. I mean, I think over and over and over again, you know, that's true in his church-state opinions, it's true in his free speech opinions, he's articulating the views that most often would probably not garner popular support. And so I think that's a really critical view of the role of the court. I think, I think that an interesting and important aspect is the putting aside the, uh, the public, the, there were backlashes to many of the decisions, and so the, the opinion of the court would sort of uh, come and go. But he cared deeply about the court as an institution, and putting aside his role as a justice, didn't want to do anything personally that would uh, negatively impact the, the sort of legitimacy of the court as an institution. And he did take it to an extreme. He essentially, after Abe Fortas was forced from the court because of ethical questions, he withdrew almost entirely from public life. But he felt it was that important that there should be no question about that justice should do anything that might cause the public uh, to, to question them and their actions outside of that court. And that, that love for the court as an institution, uh, I, th I think that's, that's an important lesson for, for justices of any ideological stripe.